Good evening. All right, y'all glad to be here tonight? All right, take your Bible out. Let's go ahead and turn back to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6. It says verses 1 through 9, but I think we're going we're gonna to tackle the whole chapter here, so that probably should be uh, 1 through 19 or so. You can open, up, open it up and put it in your lap, and I'll get there in a minute. We're going to kind of read it in three different, four, three different sections, if not four different sections tonight. Instead of reading through the whole text and going back and talking about it, I'm going to read the section that we're going to talk about. Now, every military leader in the world, every army in the world, knows that if they can get a hold to the king or the president, or the leader or the commander or their, their patent or whoever it is, their number one guy, that it will have an adverse effect upon the military that is working there. You know, whenever uh, uh, they in, in, invaded Iraq, who were they looking for when they got over there? Saddam Hussein. And whenever we were fighting with uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, who was it they were looking for? Osama bin Laden. Yeah, if we get, am I getting those names right? Y'all know how bad I am with names. So. And Satan knows that if he can attack the leader and he can separate them, it'll do a great damage to, uh, to those who are in there. Nehemiah is going to experience that in this chapter. Tobiah, Sanballat, and the other guy are going to make up rumors. They're going to they're threaten him with that. There's going to be a contract taken out on his life so that he can be killed to get him out of the way to keep him from doing what God wants him to do. Here in Nehemiah, we're going to see the governor's record, his, his notebook that he kept, how Satan used Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, uh, Geshem the Arab, to attack Nehemiah in an attempt to get him to compromise on God's will. All they want to do is stop him from doing whatever God wants them to do. And when they cannot get him stopped, they're going to slander him, they're going to attack him, and they're going to take a contract out on his life to have him killed. Then when they are unable to do that, they're going to do, do threat of war to come and attack the people and everything that they can do just to try to stop him. Now tonight, like I said, we're going to break the section into, into little sections and look at this, but we're going to find out that the way Satan works is he wants to get a leader to compromise. Because if he can get the leader to compromise on his principles and on his beliefs, he knows it's the beginning of falling it down. And when he can't get him to compromise, he's going to slander him and he's going to use whatever means he can to begin to take him down in the community so that the people will not follow the leader. And then when that doesn't work, he's going to use any kind of threat that he needs to. He's going to threaten them with their life, with their family, with terrible things happening. And then he's going to have consistent, persistent pressure to try to weaken them and destroy them along the way. So if we keep all that in mind, let's go ahead and let's, let's read. Uh, I think I want to read the first four verses in chapter 6 where it starts off and it says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab, or the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, though up to this time we hadn't set the doors in the gate, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together as that fellow right there in the plan of, oh no, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I'm going to, I'm, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. My, why should the work stop? while I leave it and come down to you. And they sent to me four times in this way. You see the persistence right there? Four times they're trying to intimidate him right here. They're trying to cause him to compromise. And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner, telling them the same thing every time that they saw it. Nehemiah knew this. This is what he knew. He knew that if the work stopped, it would never get started again. Now, how did Nehemiah know that that was the case? If you remember, back in Jerusalem, uh, back in Jerusalem, before Jerusalem fell, God spoke to Jeremiah the prophet. And Jeremiah was told then that in 70 years, Israel was going to come back and take possession of the land. Sure enough, King Zerus goes, uh, uh, Artaxerxes makes a decree. They get to come back and begin to build the temple in Jerusalem in 70 years. But they stop right there and they don't follow through with that. So in other words, they made an attempt to come back 
and they swung and they missed and they didn't complete the task. And then after that, about 10 or 15 years later, after that, they came back and made another attempt. And that's where you're going to read in the book of Ezra. Y'all know where Ezra is? The chapter is right next to it. They're going to come in. They're going to try to do the same thing. Now, some of the book of Ezra overlaps with the book of Nehemiah. and Some of it doesn't overlap with it. But they began to do the work then, and it didn't take hold. And that was the second strike. And by the way, everybody knows what happens when you get three strikes, right? Three strikes and you are out. And Nehemiah knew that if he compromised and he stopped this work this time, as they were under this oppression that they were under that we talked about this morning, he knew that he would never get the thing back on track again. So he knew that he could not compromise, and they are trying to get him to compromise off what God has already told him to do. Now, Satan will attempt uh, to let leaders waver from their deeply held convictions. Now, whether you're the father or the dad in the household with deeply held convictions, or whether you are the pastor of the church, or whether you're the missions team leader, or whether you're the deacon, or whether you're the Sunday school teacher, or the school teacher, or whether you own a Christian business, and you're the one who's got these deeply held principles, you have these deeply held principles because God has developed you in such a way that you will have those principles if you were seeking God with all of your heart. Now, people can have principles that are not of God. But those are the people that don't understand the Word of God, that aren't seeking after the Word of God. Whenever you seek after the Word of God with all of your heart and you spend your time studying the Word and you love the people that God has put under you and your desire for them is to have the best that they can possibly have, God is going to make sure that you have the principles and, and things in your heart that you need to have. So Satan will try to attack the leader. He Sometimes he'll attack from within, within the church or within the family or within the context of the school system or whatever it is. Sometimes he'll even attack from outside because he knows that if he can get to the leadership and just get the leadership to fall, everything else will come into place a little easier with those deeply held convictions so that he can cause the compromising. You know, one of the people that I think about as I talk about this right now is our Vice President of the United States. What's the Vice President's name? Mike Pence, okay? He's been all up in the news this week and everything. But you know, Mike Pence has a deeply held conviction that I, 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 I admire him for that deeply held conviction that he will not be in a room by himself with another woman. If it's a woman from, uh, uh, that he has to discuss business with, he's always going to make sure that he's got other men and other women in that area with him. Now, there's a reason for that. It's because not only uh, does he know what could possibly happen and the rumors that happen in, he also knows that he's a human being at the same time. That it's not just somebody else's problem, it's his problem at the same time. Now, does our nation try to attack him for this deeply held principle that he has in his life? And it absolutely does because Satan would love nothing more than to get him off to the side where either he could create rumors and attack him with the rumors or he would be able to go in there, get inside Mike Pence's will and mind and, 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 and Satan try to make him do things he wouldn't do or, or either send uh, an, an enemy on his half to come in and try to do that. It's possible all the way around. So always understand that that spiritual leader that you're following, whether it be a deacon, whether it be uh, the Sunday school teacher, and, and again, I want to emphasize that if you own a business here today, you've got a Christian business, maybe you're in the construction business, or whatever it is that you've got, you know, God has placed you where you are, doing what you are, and He's made you the leader that you are, and if you've got deeply held convictions that God has implanted in you in your life, you stand with those convictions. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, but if it's the convictions that God has brought you to through the the study of his word, you stand true to those convictions just like Nehemiah did when he's building this wall, which he gets built in 52 days. The second thing that we see that Satan tries to do is he tries to use slander. Have y'all ever had somebody say something about you that wasn't true? How does that make you feel when that happened? I mean, you want to slap a snot out of them, doesn't it? Right? Yeah. But you can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, uh, the, the text that I highlighted right there is where it says, It is reported that you, I heard that you, well, rumor, we, we like to say this in South Mississippi, well, rumor has it that, you know, or I heard through the, well, y'all been listening to the same people I have, hadn't you? 
All right, whenever you hear things that start off that way, always be leery about what you hear because it's probably not being repeated to you the exact way that it happened. Let's look at the text and we can see if there's some rumors that get started in here. We're going to pick up, what are we picking up, verse 5? Yeah. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time, he's persistent, isn't he? We'll give him that. For the fifth time, has sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. It is written... It is reported among the nations, and, and Geshem also says that you and the Jews intend to rebel, and that's why you're building the wall, and according to these reports, you wish to become their king, and you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. This is, uh, you, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come let us take, take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, No such thing as you say has been done. For you are inventing them out of your mind. Have you lost your ever loving mind? Are you dreaming these things up? For they all wanted to frighten us thinking... Their hands will drop from the work. In other words, they'll stop doing the work of the Lord, and it will not be done. But what does Nehemiah always do when he gets in trouble? He goes to God. He prays. Now, by the way, no matter where you are, no matter what you do, pray, pray. But now, God, oh God, strengthen my hands. Give me the resolution that I need, the resolve that I need to have to go and accomplish this. Nehemiah stayed true to the mission and he knew his mission was to get that wall built. Now he wanted to build a wall so that the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah could be protected from the enemies that were coming without. So what the enemy does is the enemy comes back and they says, well look, we know the real reason you're building the wall so you can set yourself up as the king and you can make everybody start paying taxes to you and if they pay taxes to you then you'll be able to protect yourself because you've got this wall around it and every Everybody knows that. Well, the only people that know that are the people that made that up in their mind because they're attacking the man that is doing exactly what God has called him to do. But they don't see it that way. They think that they know better than the man of God or the, or the leader who is in charge at this particular time. Now, Satan loves to use rumors. He loves to use innuendos to stifle the work of ministry. And many a time I've seen leaders in certain positions fall down because of rumors that have never been founded or anything, but they, they would end up causing a church to crumble and to call, close down. First, uh, you know, Peter had a lot to say about that. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he says this, and, and leaders, I want you to, those of you who are in those positions of leadership we talked about a while ago, uh, take, take heart to this verse of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Now, when he says Gentiles for you, think about keep your conduct among the world so that the world, when the world looks at you, it's honorable. And it goes on and it says, So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. In other words, Peter will say, Live in such a way that when they start these rumors about you, even the people who hear the rumors will know they can't possibly be true because that's outside of your character and your nature. So Satan will use these rumors and tries to things to slander folks and try to destroy them along the way. And when that doesn't work, Satan doesn't give up. He goes ahead and he begins to use what are not idle threats, but real threats to hurt somebody. So let's pick up now in verse 10 and continue to read on where it says, Now when I went to the house of Shemai and the son of Delai, okay, and the son of this, this, this person here, who was confined to his home. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the door of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Now, is that a threat? They are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. So in the dark, when you can't see, somebody's going to come up behind you and take your life. But I said, Should such a man as I run away? And as a spiritual leader, you don't have an option to run away. Your option is to take care of what God has called you to do. And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in because it was in the Holy of Holies. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him 
but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him to do so. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in the way, in, in this way, in sin. Listen to what he just said. If I'm intimidated by this and it causes me to get off the path of God, I, the spiritual leader, have just done what? You've sinned. Because you've got to accomplish the task. It is a sin for a spiritual leader to know what they're supposed to do and not do what they're supposed to do. And God will hold them personally accountable when the thing falls apart, not only for their personal sin, but for the sin of those that they've led astray by doing the wrong thing. Leadership carries a great weight. For this purpose, he was hired that he should do that. Remember, going on, it says, Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God. He goes back in prayer again. Oh my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophet Noah, Diah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. And all God's people said. Amen. Satan threatened Nehemiah with his very own life, that he was going to kill him, that he was going to have him put to death. But Nehemiah was not afraid of the threat. He was afraid. He was afraid. Nehemiah was afraid. You know what Nehemiah was afraid of? He's afraid he wouldn't carry out the will of God. When the Bible says to fear the Lord, that's exactly what it's talking about. Nehemiah's got two options. He needs to be afeard of somebody. He needs to be afeard of somebody. Either he needs to be afeard of the people who are fixing to kill him, or he needs to be afeard of the Lord. And Nehemiah knew that he had to have a fear of the Lord. And as a spiritual leader, this is something that I learned several years back, and I've, I've, I've understood this to deeper levels every year that I walk with Christ. If you fear some person, if you fear some event happening to you in your life, you do not properly fear God. Because the Bible says we're to fear God. We should be more afraid of not doing what God wants us to do than we are afraid of people taking our own lives and killing us. Because when God calls a man to a mission, when God calls a woman to a mission, that woman or that man is going to carry out the mission that God has called them to do, and nothing can stop them. So what Nehemiah did was, instead of being afraid of Tobiah and Sanzibut and Gershom, he revered the Lord. He trusted in the sovereignty of God to work out everything. It's almost as if he had already read through the book and got to Matthew chapter, uh, uh, chapter 6, 33, where it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all of these other things will be added unto you. All of these other things will be worked out. Our job is to revere God. Our job is to stay true to the Word no matter what threats come our way. Now Satan will find ways to threaten you as a leader, as a spiritual leader, and they'll try to intimidate every spiritual leader that he can possibly intimidate. He'll use tactics like he'll, he, he'll, he'll threaten that he's going to expose your own personal sin, and every leader has some kind of personal sin in their lives. He'll threaten you with the fact that he's going to kill you. Is it possible that somebody could walk in this building right now and try to shoot the spiritual leaders that we have at Regional Heights Baptist Church, and you no, the truth of the matter is they can absolutely try to do that. Satan will try to uh, uh, ruin the reputation of those people who are in those positions with those rumors and those innuendos. And then I think the, the fourth thing that we see out of the text here is the sheer persistent pressure that Satan continues to put on those people. It is a never unrelenting pressure that stays on your spiritual leaders. Let's read the rest of the chapter out, uh, picking up uh, where it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month, Elul, El 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 yeah, in the 20, in the 50, in 52 days. And when all of our enemies heard it, and all the nations around us were afraid. And they fell greatly in their esteem. For they perceived that the work had been accomplished. What? With the help of our God. By the way, 
I want to tell you something. I, I have learned this too. I heard the last preacher I had that I served under at the Escatoba Baptist Church, and he taught this, and he come from Henry Blackaby, uh, one of the great spiritual leaders of our time. It's written. He said, if you can explain how something happened at the church, it probably wasn't God that accomplished it. But when you cannot explain how all of that came together and it happened, it probably was God that accomplished that. And the people are standing in awe of this bunch of people who have come back in 52 days and built a wall that's had total oppositions, threats of war and murder and rumor and political ruin, yet they still accomplished the task that God had called them to accomplish. The only way they could accomplish that is if God is in the middle of what is taking place. And... And also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. But he could not make him afraid because he was a man after God's own heart, accomplishing what God has told him to accomplish. The pressure on Nehemiah was persistent and never let up. And it did, it did not let up on him until the day that the wall was complete. And even when the day was complete, there was still pressure. Maybe a little lighter, but still pressure there. Then and only then did all the nations around him relent in fear of the Lord. When God looks at your family, when God looks at your business that you've got, when God looks at your, um, your, your, you as a school teacher and you accomplish what you accomplish, and they think, there's no way that so-and-so can be that kind of teacher. I know they just barely graduated from high school or, you know, all these kind of things. Then the only conclusion that they can come to is it's not that person that did the work. It's Almighty God that did the work. And we learned that to be true. I want to pull out some applications from this message tonight. And these are very personal to me, but uh, I think it's very important to know the church know them too. I want to give some applications to the church. And I don't want to give some applications to those of you who find yourself as spiritual leaders. So I'm going to pop them all up at the church first. One thing that the church needs to do is to pray diligently for each and every spiritual leader that's in the congregation. Now, everybody is under somebody else's authority. Even I'm under the authority of God, and I'm under your authority as you, the church. And, and, and some of you are under uh, Sunday school's authority. Some of you are under a different uh, uh, Miss Nita in the children's department. I mean, we're all under all kinds of authority along the way. What's the one thing that we can do to help out in that situation? We need to pray diligently for each one of those spiritual leaders. And I can honestly tell you right now, at this stage in ministry at Ridgeland Heights Baptist Church, I would not be standing up here speaking to you today if it wasn't for the hundreds and hundreds of you every day that lift me up in prayer. I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for that Tuesday morning prayer meeting that we have when all of those men come around and they lift up my name in prayer from day to day. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the prayers of my wife that lift me up to accomplish the things that I'm able to accomplish during this period of time because there is strength in those prayers that you're lifting up to God. The leaders that are over you are accomplishing what they're accomplishing because you, the people of Ridgely, are praying for them. And I praise you and I thank you for that. Let me tell you something. Pray for the dads. Pray for the husbands. Pray for the school teachers. Pray for the Sunday school teachers. Pray for those people that are leading mission teams and going off because God is going to do a mighty work through all of them and your prayers make all the difference. If we didn't think they made a difference, we wouldn't call our mission teams down here before we send them off, lay our hands on them and pray for them before we send them off to different places in the country and the world. But it does make a difference. Second thing that you as a church can do, you can work co corporately to find ways to give your leaders the ample rest that they need to have. Thank you so much this afternoon. I want you to know I spent three hours of sleep. I went on my couch today and I fell asleep and I woke up and one hour had passed just like that. So I did what every good preacher should do on Sunday as I got up and I went to the little boy's room. Then I laid down in the bed and slept for two more hours. <laughs> and now I got a zip in my step from that. Amen. All right. Don't I look like I just woke up? <laughs> but you got to have the rest because if you don't have the rest, you can't be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. You can't be the spiritual leader that God has called you to be. And the third thing I think we can do as a church is determine ways to share the load with the spiritual leaders. Look, 
you may be in a small group. You're in a Sunday school class, or you're in the prayer group that meets on Thursday. One of the prayer, one of the groups that that meets in houses during the week, or one of those other times it comes together. Don't let the teacher in that small group carry all the way to the load. Find ways that you can help them. Call them up in the middle of the week and pray for them or, or look for ways that you can help them accomplish the task that they're going to have. In fact, maybe blow their minds out of the water. Call them one day and say, hey, would you like for me to teach Sunday school for you this week just to give you a week off? And that teacher will probably go say, what? <laughs> but they'll be tickled to death that you will. Yeah, just, yeah some of the Sunday schools, they say, please just study your lesson. I'll be happy with that. You know? But help Find ways to share the load. Go make those visits or whatever for the class and the place of your teacher. And then I'm going to stop talking to the church right there, and I want to talk to you spiritual leaders there. Again, business leaders, uh, family, head of household, teachers, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever leadership position that you have. Be uncompromising when it comes to biblical truth. If it has to do with your conviction, you may need to check back in the Word of God and make sure you're in your right place in the conviction. Conviction. But when it comes to biblical truth, don't you ever sell out for biblical truth. When you know that this is what the Word of God teaches, you live according to that Word of God. Second thing is, is stay focused on your God-given mission. If your mission is to, is to, is to lead people to Christ in, in a small group setting or whatever, that's what your mission is. Stay focused on that. If your mission is to disciple those who have been led to Christ, stay focused on that mission. If your mission is to feed the people who are coming in on Wednesday night, stay focused on the mission that you've got to feed those people that are there. If your mission is to go out and, 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 and to chaperone the youth on a youth trip, let your mission be that. Go with those youth and don't just be a, an adult that's there. Be an adult that cares about those children when you're with those children and pour your life into them for the two or three days that you're there with them. And then thirdly, stay in close communion with the Father. Because if you, you, if you lose that communion with Him, even one day, it's going to make a huge difference in you. It's going to cause you to stumble and slip and fall. There is nothing more important in your life than that communion time that you have with God. You got to read His Word, you got to pray to Him, you got to listen to Him, and you got to continue to develop that. One of the things that be careful, spiritual leaders, because I, I know this is one of the things that happen. You can get so busy as a spiritual leader developing lessons that you're going to teach that all you do is develop the lessons that you teach. And when you do, Satan has got you right where he wants you. Because you'll lose your connection with God because you're too worried about delivering the message to the people that are there. There's a higher priority than you teaching the message to somebody else. And that is that relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. You'll lose your song if you don't have your daily time with the Father. You can have your daily time with the Father and still lose your song. And you, you got to stay connected and focused. If you get up every morning at 4.30 in the morning and you go in a closet in your house and you've been doing that for 12 years and you go in there right now and you can't connect with the Father when you get in there, let me, let me suggest something to you. Quit getting up at 4.30 and going in the closet and trying to connect with the Father in there. 9 o'clock in the morning, go to the park, climb a tree or a tree stand. Go to someplace new. Go to the end of the pier down in Pascagoula or wherever you got to go so that you can commune with the Father. But make sure you commune with the Father every day. It's not Him that's grown stale. It's us. And we have to make sure we don't. Spiritual leader, here's the last one. Pull away and rest off it. As a spiritual leader, you have a tendency to think, well, if I don't do it, it won't get done. Nothing could be further from the truth. God does not have to have you to build the wall. He may call you to build the wall, but he's sending other people to come alongside of you. Um, I gave somebody today, I told him I was going to do something in the morning, and they came and talked back in my office a while ago and asked me if I'd lost my ever-loving mind. And they instructed me of the other places and things I had to do tomorrow and said that I couldn't do that. And they would handle it. And they just stepped up to take care of that. To give me the time that I need to pull back and focus on the other things that need me to focus on. That's, that's, how, uh, that, that's, that's how we function and share the road. But as spiritual leaders, sometimes we just got to pull away and rest so that God can use us profoundly in our lives.
Let's pray together. God,